Morning, everyone. We're delighted to be here. I'm Vanessa Gibbon. I lead on marketing and behaviour change at Material Focus. Oh, I'm Scott Butler. I'm the executive director. And I want to avoid lurking at the back like Donald Trump in an election debate. So I'm not trying to do that if it comes across like that. <laughs> Uh, so thanks for your time today. We've been asked to share some of what we've learnt from working within the Electricals Extended Producer Responsibility. So hopefully we offer a slightly different perspective, having done it, albeit in a different area. Um, and there certainly seem to be many parallels. So we've got 20 minutes today to talk to you. Um, what we're going to cover is quickly who we are and how we're funded and what the impact of that is, uh, a snapshot of the e-waste challenge and what we're doing to increase reuse and recycling of electricals, and then some broader insights from our work in EPR of electricals. So Material Focus are an independent, not-for-profit organisation. And I suppose the independence bit is really important. We worked very closely with DEFRA from the outset, but the independence allows us to take the uh, compliance fund that we manage and spend it in the way that is most effective for reuse and recycling. And I know that's been a lot of discussion about that already. So we were set up in 2019 to manage the compliance fund to support the delivery of waste electrical regulations. In practice, what that means now is making it easier to fix, donate, sell and recycle electricals. And we're funded by the electrical producers and importers selling electricals but missing the recycling targets as part of the EPR. So the e-waste challenge. Our challenge will probably feel very familiar to you. The numbers are smaller, but e-waste is the fastest growing waste stream in the world and in the UK. So people buy billions, as they do with fashion, billions of brand new electricals every year, or as the data shows here, 2.2 million tonnes of electricals, new models, new colours, different modes, different functionality. Some of that is replacing old, broken electricals, but in many cases, people are being seduced by buying new electricals to add to their collection, which isn't that surprising because brands spent £66 million last year persuading us all to buy new small electricals, and we spent £2 million on encouraging reuse and recycling. So our challenge is what happens next after we've bought the electricals. As you can see from the stats on the right-hand side, almost 500,000 tonnes goes in the right direction, is uh, sent to approved electrical recyclers and is reused. Uh, but over 100,000 tonnes is being binned. And that is really where we have spent most of our time focusing. There's still more stashed away in people's homes, many unwanted gifts or unused electricals still waiting to find their reuse journey. And hundreds of thousands of tonnes are being illegally exported, stolen or fly tipped. Thank you. So, what is our strategy to do what we were tasked to do, which was to, to, to try and fix or at least take on these challenges and opportunities? So, we've created a three-I strategy, a three-pillar strategy that we believe is adaptable. If you just change the word electrical and put textiles in there, put mattresses in there, put plant pots in there, the theory is exactly the same. And it's a three-pillar strategy of insights, investments and inspiration. So the insights bit is basically we find out what's going on. What do people think? What they feel? What are their behaviours? Where is the material? What, what material is there? Where is it? Where are we losing it to things that we don't want to happen? How can we increase the volume of the things that we do want to happen? And we take all of those insights and then we turn them into a series of investments and some other communications activity. So the investments is we go out there and work with many others to identify in the first place and then fund the behaviours or fund the infrastructure that we need. So for electricals, a lot of that is around new drop-off points for reuse and recycling, working with local authorities, community sector organisations. One thing that we were able to do quite quickly when COVID hit was we put a, a million pounds of interest-free loans into the recyclers who weren't getting material at that point. At the same time, we gave half a million pounds in grants to over 52 community sector organisations. So it shows you that with that funding part, 
with the right degree of stakeholder consultation, you can pivot very quickly and respond to, which was obviously a very unexpected set of circumstances that we were all dealing with. But it's also around new collection projects, amnesty days, schools collections, across the piece, bring banks, we've got bright bring banks on public streets. Anyone here from Brighton? Okay, look out in Brighton, you'll see some bright pink banks, that stuff that we're helping. So basically bringing collection points closer. And of course, in the textiles industry, you're very familiar with textile banks. And then the inspiration bit is, 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 is a communications campaign, which is a combination of marketing and direct communications, but also taking some of those, that research and turning that into stories that resonate and, and, and get picked up. And we'll touch a little bit more on that in a sec. So on the insight strand, one of the things that we've learned about, we've looked at product and waste flows, as I said. Metrics are really, really important. Our main measure in the waste electrical world is a recycling target, a ton recycling target. That is not really fit for purpose with, with what we're facing now, which we want to move to more reuse, more repair. All of that stuff is not really being collected in the regulatory system. So what we've ended up with, I'd say, is more of a, like a transactional compliance that's going on. So people are taking evidence notes and saying, yes, I've complied, but they're not necessarily moving up that circular chain to do the activ activities that they want. We produce independent in industry briefings. Um, Vapes, that was all us. I apologize if you're sick of hearing stories about vapes, but that was an idea we had. And then suddenly we realized that the most environmentally damaging, dangerous, wasteful consumer product was in our midst. Um, critical raw material recovery rates, which are very similar to some of the material challenges that you guys will face. You've got fast fashion. We've created fast tech, which is, a, is fast tech, the new fast fashion. And that's vapes. It's those cheap fans that people are carrying. It's the decorative seasonal lights. All, all of that is working cross-sector with us as we're looking at things like digital inclusion as well. And you know, as I said, you just change some of that, vo that vocab and you can see that it would resonate with what you're trying to do as an industry. That's just a flavor of all those insights that we've been producing. Everything is made available to everybody as well. And then on the investment side, we've got three main strands. So our electricals recycling fund has been used now from uh, the Orkneys down to the Isles of Scilly, from Derry over to Norfolk, so north, south, east, west. Over 10 million people are finding it easier to do what we want them to do. We're just about to launch a circular electricals fund, an innovation fund, and we're also in the early days of looking at more community-based recycling support as well. Over to you. Thanks. So in the inspiration section, the third pillar is, is really about, um, it's really delivered through our Recycle Your Electricals campaign. And we started with this consumer problem, which will also be part of your problem as well, it is a very human one. 80% of the UK public think that recycling is a good thing. And in fact, more than that, we'll be doing recycling. RAP's data, I think, suggests maybe 88% of people are recycling, despite not really thinking it's a good thing. And yet, 40% still admit to binning their electricals, which means it's probably much higher than that. So this intention action gap is not uncommon. It's a, a common problem in behavior change, but it is an annoying and knotty problem to crack. So, we've got uh, a mix of barriers. The ones at the top, they, bluntly, they are uh, split into ability and motivation. So the ones at the top are all around uh, ability and they relate to awareness. So less than 70% of people are confident that their electricals can be recycled. And this drops significantly for the smaller electricals, so the newer electricals like vapes, uh, fast tech and accessories. Perhaps they don't know how to or don't know where to. So it's just too, it makes it just feel too, too much like hard work. Maybe they don't have availability of recycling points in their area or places that they can go and drop off their electricals to donate them. Or maybe they just don't know about it. And for many, it's driven by convenience. So, and that depends on where you live in the country, which local authority you live in, whether you live in a big house with lots of space, whether, or you live in a small flat and you have no recycling options, whether you, are, whether you are physically mobile, whether you have a car or whether you don't. And then on the motivation side, that is the intention or the desire to go and do the behavior, 
The first one to talk about really is the social norm, and that is not to be underestimated. So if you don't see other people around you doing these things, then you either don't learn that you should be doing it, or you think no one really cares. So there's no pressure on you to, to go and comply with that action either. Trust is a massive issue in the recycling industry, as you're probably aware, that we've all read so many headlines about things being shipped off to China. And in the electricals world, it is further compounded by, people really see this as a black box. With its complexity of materials, how on earth can this possibly be stripped apart and all the different materials divided up and be reused in a meaningful way? And psychologically, for many, it's just too, too, too much effort, too hard work, and they just want to get rid of it now. If you live in a small flat, you just haven't really got space to store it for the next trip that you take. So when we were think thinking then, under having understood the barriers, we were thinking about where to focus. We looked at a few behavior change models. We've used a few different ones. But I think the most useful for us has been the FOG behavior model. So this is, what we like about it is that it's so simple. Along the x-axis, you can see that is someone's ability to do the behavior. And the y-axis donate, um, denotes the motivation to do it. And this sort of orange line, is, they call the action line, um, any prompts that are above that um, mean that it is, those nudges are likely to work. Anything underneath mean that it probably won't. And BJ Fogg, uh, he's a professor at Stanford University, a leading light in uh, behavior change study. He posits and has proven that B equals MAP, you can see in the top right, that in order for a behavior to happen, you need to have motivation, ability, and a prompt. And all those three things need to happen in the same moment. And if the behavior isn't occurring, then one of those are missing. The model also shows, I think, that the, brings to life the compensatory relationship between ability and motivation. So if you imagine top left, something's, uh, someone's very motivated. I want to go and run the London Marathon. I'm really motivated to do it. Then I can do really hard things. If it's something a bit more mundane, like recycling in the right way, then I might be less motivated, and then it really needs to be much, much easier to do in order to get people doing that behavior. So we have prioritized making it feel as well as be easier in order to maximize the number of people who are going to act. We have focused on mental and physical ease. So we've simplified the messaging, the process to reduce any friction that might stop people. We have spent time um, making sure that it is appearing in the media and that people are talking about it and our ads are sufficiently high profile that makes it feel like it is just in amongst you and everybody is at it and, and you're gonna be missing out or you're the odd one out if you're not. And we've been highlighting all the local drop-off points that actually are there. That We've got 26,000 on our recycling locator on our website, but you'd be forgiven for, no, for not knowing that you have local drop-off points. And then physically, as Scott mentioned before, we've been expanding the local repair, donation, and recycling drop-off network, making it easier for 10 million more people to reuse and recycle their electricals. From a motivation point of view, it's mainly about finding universal messages that appeal to as many people as possible at the key moments when they're acting. So at the moment when your electrical breaks is the moment when you need to know about that message. It needs to be an auto automatic and habitual behavior because we don't have 66 million pounds to motivate people every year to reuse and recycle. Um, and these are just three core motivators that we all as humans have. We want to do things that make us feel more hopeful and less fearful. So we talk about saving precious materials from being lost forever. We, we also don't want to do things that, that generate fear. So we have been running hidden battery campaigns. So batteries inside electricals, lithium ion batteries, which start fires when they're binned or put in paper and plastic recycling. Um, and we've, as I say, we've spent a lot of time on making sure that people feel that the right herd to be part of is the one that are recycling and reusing their electricals. Okay. 
this is our website. Um, we've made it as simple as possible, as you can see. Anything with a plug battery cable can be reused or recycled. This is HypnoCat, if you haven't seen him before. He's our award-winning mess messenger. Uh, he's a hypnotic cat, and he allows us to deliver very, very direct messages in a very simple and memorable way. And this is some of our comms. You can look at those later. Uh, I was going to show the ad, but I'm not sure whether it will work. No. OK, it's not going to work. It's a TV ad of HypnoCat. It's got a banging tune to it. Go and look at it afterwards. Um, and this is just to say, in the media, we've really been driving the debate and normalizing electrical reuse and recycling. Scott spent a lot of time talking, uh, to, uh, being interviewed, including on the red sofa of the one show. <coughs> And you can see how the media interest is growing. So 2020 was when we started. So it's not just us talking about the issue. It's everybody, this blue bar, is everybody is getting behind it, talking about e-waste. And it seems to be having impact. So 66% of the population last year, when polled, said they recycled at least one electrical in the last year. Over 3 million visitors to our website. And last year, the data is an issue, like it is with you. But in the 2023 versus 2022 data, 14 million more small electricals were recycled than in 2022. Great, okay. So we've been having a thing, we were asked to have a think how what we do can relate across and what are some of the common issues. Um, I think the conversation here, it's been happening before, it will continue. It's really important that you're at the cost allocation and financing is very clear in any EPR system. Who bears the cost and how do they do that in, in what cycle, equity, relationships between bricks and mortar and online sellers, of course. The whole issue around material complexity and, and sorting. And I guess you've got your mainstream materials, as we have, which is a sort of steel, plastic, aluminium, gold that are common in electricals. But we're now seeing issues with things like brominated flame retardants in, in plastics. You will have issues around weatherproof coating and other things that will come down the pipe. Um, circular design for recycling, what are the industry standards, how do you collaborate? Obviously you compete, but what are the areas that you can actually collaborate on for the greater good? Uh, behavior change, as we said before, that's both physical and, 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 and mental, and where are you prioritizing that? Data, traceability, accountability, setting the right kinds of targets, as I mentioned before, you know, the, the current target for the waste electrical regulations is probably no longer fit for purpose. Uh, also something in there, which I'm not quite sure is covered by any of those, is flexibility. One of the things that we saw with, with vapes is that the, the waste electrical regulations were written 25 years ago to deal with fridges. Uh, they weren't fit to deal with, with hundreds of millions of fast-moving consumer good electricals hitting the market. So you need to somehow get some flex into what you're doing. The infrastructure seems important. I'm hearing that today. We've not had to invest too much in new recycling yet, but it, that may be the case going forward, and particularly within the textiles. And then this whole issue around standardization of regulation. Um, the seven, you know, there were seven bins, the seven deadly bins story, which was basically about how each local authority has different recycling. You've, that will be a factor. Where, where are clothes going to be picked up and, and, and collected? The debate around retailer take back, waste and recycling are devolved issues. So you could have four different versions of, of any future legislation that comes through. So all those issues we, we have dealt with and, and, and could easily, happily support you in how you respond to those. Okay, so please bear with me. Um, people used to watch the news, there used to be an Anne Finally story where it would be about an otter making best friends with a duck or something like that. <laughs> so those of you who read fiction, there's often a coda at the end of the book, which is a sort of, sort of variance or a neat summing up or something different. I think probably most of us have enjoyed and are now suffering the slew of Marvel films um, that we all watch with our families during lockdown and they are famous for their post-credit scenes. So I'm introducing a new concept today, I don't have a name for it yet, it's a post-presentation digestive, um, which is really just for a bit of fun. But basically we were surprised this year to receive two amazing celebrity endorsements, in no way fictionalised. So please don't take these out of the room and pretend that they are real. It is just in my imagination. But those of you who watched the Oscars would have seen Ryan Gosling do an amazing performance of the, uh, the I Am Ken song. So when he came to London to film in Teddington, he also helped us launch our Bring Banks in Richmond. And there you can see he gave a one-off performance that I'm sure you, always, you all saw in the news. 
So when Ryan, or Rye, as he likes me to call him, <laughs> went back to Hollywood, he met up with one of his friends, and who's now a mutual friend, who we call Tay-Tay. And um, she was recently uh, in the news for endorsing Kamala Harris, and at the same time, she took a little bit of time from her era's tour trip to London to visit us and, and to meet, guess who? Hypnocat. <laughs> and to endorse our message too, as well. And I'm sharing those for a bit of fun, but also to show that what you can do with sustainability circular economy, you can lean into it, you can have fun with it. Textiles and fashion industry are, are full of that creativity, so take it, you know, be on the front foot, use your creativity, use your communication skills. But there's only one star of the show for us, and that is, of course, Hypnocat, and he comes with a special message for you, you will recycle your old electricals. Thank you very much.